We're going to discuss Native Americans in the late 19th century. This is a tragic story. Uh, there's not much positive about it uh, for uh, the fate of Native Americans in the West. Uh, we should begin maybe with the assumptions that white Americans, Anglo-Americans brought to uh, dealing with Native Americans. Uh, the first assumption was that land should be used productively as they defined uh, productive use. Uh, that meant mining, ranching, and farming, the three activities uh, that brought so many settlers uh, to the West in the period after the Civil War. Uh, the assumption was that if they, someone was living a nomadic life on that land, that they weren't using it productively. Of course, Native Americans uh, strongly disagreed. This was their way of life. Um, another assumption that uh, Anglo-Americans made was that the presence of gold uh, was far more important than anything else. Um, they might make a treaty, but if gold was discovered, uh, that overrode everything. Now, uh, we, could, we can identify stages of uh, federal government policy toward Native Americans in the 19th century. Um, before the Civil War, uh, the uh, most common model was separation, uh, moving uh, Indians west of the Mississippi River. Uh, the most uh, dramatic and tragic example of that was the Trail of Tears in the late 1830s, um, in which uh, so many uh, Native Americans died uh, while being forcibly moved to the Indian Territory, which is the present day uh, state of Oklahoma. Uh, the, uh, the next model that was used was concentration, uh, where uh, the Indian Territory was divided up into reservations for specific tribes. Uh, and the goal was to move as many Native Americans to their reservation as possible. The third model uh, was extermination, simply wiping them out, and that uh, is probably the, the most realistic way to look at Indian wars and certainly at a number of massacres that were carried out by the U.S. Army. Uh, and then finally, uh, in what uh, a lot of people thought was a humane and much improved way of dealing with uh, the Native Americans, uh, the, the fourth model was Americanization, and the example of that was the Dawes Act making them as much like uh, mainstream Americans as possible. Now we're going to talk about, we've already talked about separation uh, in the period before the Civil War. Uh, we're going to look at these other three. Um, this is the Indian Territory after the Trail of Tears. Uh, there are some general uh, areas where one group or another uh, was moved to. Uh, but if you look at that same map uh, in the uh, period after the Civil War, uh, you can see how complex these reservations were. Uh, there are many, many divisions uh, of what will become Oklahoma, and uh, the different tribes are designated for one area or another. Of course, if you go to Oklahoma now, you'll find that uh, they don't control uh, most of this land. Uh, which, again, is uh, an indication of, of uh, the, the violation of, of treaties and agreements. Uh, the next uh, model that was used was extermination, uh, where th there were simply battles that uh, wiped out huge numbers. Uh, there were, uh, as you can see, many here. Uh, some of the most notorious were the massacre at Sand Creek here in uh, southeastern Colorado in 1864. Uh, the, uh, a number of battles, the uh, uh, Fetterman uh, uh, battle uh, in which uh, Native Americans fought back uh, and defeated uh, the, the, uh, a group of, of uh, soldiers from the U.S. Army, 1866. 
uh, there were other uh, battles back and forth. Uh, the most successful of the Indian uh, attacks was at Little Bighorn, that's General Custer, in 1876. Uh, uh, the final battle uh, was at Wounded Knee uh, in what is now uh, southern South Dakota, the Pine Ridge Reservation, in 1890, and that was the last uh, of the Indian Wars. Uh, the pattern was that treaties were made uh, which were dishonest. Uh, they were violated repeatedly by the U.S. government. Uh, on these reservations that were set up, there was a lot of corruption. A lot of the uh, money that was funneled through the Bureau of Indian, Appa Indian Affairs, that was a federal agency, uh, ended up going into the pockets of those who administered the money. So there was a lot of corruption. Uh, the one of the most notorious of uh, the conflicts was the Sand Creek Massacre in Colorado. Um, there is a lot of disagreement about what exactly happened, but there's significant evidence that uh, a, a number, a, a, a sizable number of men, women, and children were simply wiped out. Uh, there are stories of uh, soldiers simply taking using uh, children as target practice. Uh, and then, as I said, the uh, the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876 was a defeat for the army. Uh, but this has to be seen in the context of earlier attacks by the army on uh, groups uh, of Native Americans that same year. Uh, this was a response uh, to, the, to those attacks. Uh, the Nez Perce War of 1877 uh, is uh, this is in the Pacific Northwest, uh, and uh, this this led to a, a very sad situation in which uh, Chief Joseph, who was maybe the most eloquent of all the uh, Native Amer American leaders of this period, uh, simply uh, summed things up when he said uh, that that his people were exhausted uh, and that they would uh, fight no more. Forever. Uh, finally, the Battle of Wounded Knee in 1890 uh, was uh, a response to something called the Ghost Dance. It was a, a desperate, uh, really a, a religious ritual uh, to uh, to try to bring back uh, a day of hope uh, for the uh, Lakota Lakota Sioux people. Uh, it was. Uh, uh, that scared uh, U.S. officials, and they responded uh, very aggressively, uh, and uh, the, the, the battle was really uh, not much more than a, than a, a massacre. Uh, and this was the last major conflict with Native Americans uh, on, on a battlefield in American history. Now, uh, another way in which uh, the lives of the Plain, Plains Indians were uh, severely uh, diminished uh, was the near extinction of the buffalo. Uh, in 1846, there were 25 million of these animals on the plains. Uh, by 1889, there were only 1,100 left. Uh, now, why? Well, buffalo fur robes were popular among some people in the East. Uh, some of their hides were used as belts for factory machines. But there was also recreational hunting. Uh, some railroads would sponsor uh, trips that uh, people would take. I know there were a lot, a lot of Europeans who uh, liked to do this. And uh, they would simply... Uh, travel in comfort, uh, have, you know, good food, uh, uh, luxuries, and uh, the train would stop when it saw a buffalo. Uh, they would open the windows, and then uh, these travelers would simply take uh, target practice out the windows of the trains and uh, leave the carcasses to rot uh, on the plains. Uh, one of the reasons why the government uh, allowed this sort of thing 
was that they thought that Indians ought to farm. Uh, they ought to be like uh, other Americans. Uh, that was a disaster, which we'll get to in, in a few minutes. Uh, there, another reason, uh, buffalo meat was used to feed soldiers. So there's a variety of different reasons why uh, the uh, buffalo were nearly extinct. Uh, again, uh, images of uh, being hunted from trains. Now, to get a sense of what difference this made, uh, we should look at uh, some of the uses uh, to which uh, Plains Indians put the buffalo. Uh, I'm not going to comment on these in detail, but I just uh, want you to look at the number of uses uh, they could be uh, put to. Uh, this is only one screen. Here's another. The different parts of the buffalo and the ways they could be used. Um, Here's another. And finally, one more. Uh, this was the basis of uh, the Plains Indians' economy. Uh, and when, it, when the buffalo were almost entirely destroyed, uh, the, the, that economy and that culture could not survive. Now, what came out of this? Uh, in 1887, Congress passed the Dawes Act. Uh, a lot of it was well-intentioned. They thought, well, uh, let's make uh, farmers out of uh, Indians uh, and give them individual land ownership rather than uh, group ownership on reservations. Uh, but there was a lot of leftover land, and that land was sold to whites by the federal government uh, and passed forever out of the hands of Native Americans. Uh, if one lived separate from the tribe and quote-unquote adopted the habits of civilized life, then one could be an American citizen. Uh, but one way or another, most of the land uh, was lost uh, sooner or later. Now, an especially uh, negative aspect of the Dawes Act was that it provided for the establishment of boarding schools created for Indian children. Uh, let's address these for a moment. Uh, some children were taken against the will of their parents. They were simply, it, it amounted to kidnapping really. Uh, at these schools, which were often long distances from the, the homes of, of these children, uh, they were punished for speaking their own language. They were forced to learn and speak English. Uh, their hair was cut. They were forced to wear conventional American clothing. Uh, and the justification uh, for this can be found in a quotation by the founder of the most famous of these schools, the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. Uh, Richard Pratt. Uh, is quoted as saying, kill the Indian and save the man. So in order to save people, you had to deny them their culture. But then once that was done, uh, the implied promise was that they would be accepted into mainstream American culture. Uh, but they were not. Uh, they, uh, when they returned home, uh, they were alienated from their culture, and they were never accepted as equals in American society. Uh, so they were outcasts, uh, not really part of either world. Here's a uh, Native American uh, upon arriving at the Carlisle Indian School. Uh, Pratt liked to do before and after photos. Uh, this is what he looked like after he was remade. Same person. Another group of uh, before and after photos. Uh, 